You are listening to a Yodokin podcast. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us at the Yodokin podcast. For those listening in for the first time, the Yodokin podcast is a broader conversation with the Yoda Press authors and books. I am Kanchana Vishwanathan, the translator of Chellamar's journal, which records the journey of a woman in an upper caste joint family in early 20th century Nagarkovil, Tamil Nadu. It excavates the complex familial relationships within the walls of the house and the interplay of love, hurt, affection, disappointment, anger, and control, which thwart the aspirations of a young woman. In her memoir, Chellamal is especially sensitive to the treatment of young widows in a Brahmin Tamil society. She raises questions and concerns about a society that places its women under tremendous scrutiny and the reader can feel her indignation at the oppressive social customs that suffocate a woman's ability to have a more complete life. Written at a time when dissent or disagreement by women in Chalamar circumstances would have been frowned upon, the book provides the reader with a rare contemporary look at the interior of an upper caste 20th century Tamil household. This English translation brings the narrative to life for non-Tamil speaking readers for the first time. So my view on my mother changed a lot after translating her memoirs to English. Before that, Amma Chalamol was foremost a good cook. She could rattle off names of Carnatic music ragas even before the first line of the song was completed. She was easy to please. She did not have many great expectations or demands. I never considered using adjectives like smart, intellectual, deep thinker, excellent writer to describe her. But now I realize that she was all that and more. I'm also overwhelmed with their ability to empathize with the other disadvantaged women, especially widows. I do feel sad that her youth was wasted in a stifling joint family atmosphere. I regret that I did not adequately acknowledge her intellect or show empathy towards her when she was still around. I'm making now amends by sharing her words with the rest of the world. So I now I would like to share a few excerpts from the book Chelamal's journal, which I have translated from the original Tamil. I want to start with a few words from the foreword I have written uh, for the book. Uh, I want to also show her as a multidimensional person, a fun-loving person. So in, in a lighthearted moment, um, I wanted to um, share a small incident that happened when she was visiting me in 1986 in the USA. I am based in USA uh, for the last several years or decades. So I was newly married then. We took her to a casino in Reno, which is like Las Vegas. She won $1.50 with a 25 cent bet placed in the slot machine and enjoyed the sound of the shower of coins falling out of the machine. We also took her to a late night adult show. The women dancers wore skimpy clothes and Amma said somewhat admiringly, these are half naked, but they have such good figures like beautifully sculpted statues. And so it does not appear anywhere near as vulgar as it does in some of our Indian movies. So now I want to switch a gear and talk about the more serious stuff that she has written throughout the book. Her, she covers a lot of topics, but one of the things that she gets back to again and again is the status of widows in our um, Indian Hindu society. In her narrative, she has interspersed descriptions of memorable events in her life with the reflections on the plight of women, both in the context of her situation and in general. I felt that the content is still very relevant to women all over the world, whose aspirations and potentials are ignored and whose needs are suppressed because of societal, religious, and political pressures. The challenges faced by women are universal and still very serious, more than a century after my mother's early life experiences. She comes back several times in a narrative to the theme of the mistreatment of widows by the orthodox Hindu society that she was part of in her younger days. 
where young widows were forced to withdraw from society and live a painful existence in the shadows. Her disdain for this practice seems to have been shaped and reinforced by her witnessing the plight of her older sister who was widowed at a very young age. Actually, I think it was about 22 when she was widowed. So now I'm going on to share a few of her words um, in the book. And there's a thread connecting throughout about uh, widows. So I would like to first start with a page um, where she's describing her grandmother's situation uh, when the grandmother becomes a widow. And mind you, this is my mother's grandmother. So it also gives an idea of what these women felt like during those times. When Tata died, that is the grandfather, people from the village showed up to offer condolences to party. Some said, Ramasubhi, how sad that you have to face such an awful situation, despite you having reached a ripe old age. She was 67 then. He beat you in leaving for the next world. Surely a virtuous woman like you should have been blessed by being allowed to leave this world before him, while still being able to wear the flowers and potu, the prerogative of a married woman. Probably this is due to bad karma from a previous life. Party used to reply tersely, yes, I'm not that fortunate. After they would leave, she would say, these people are idiots. I didn't come into this world tethered to him. Our bond happened later. Anyway, he was not all that affectionate or caring towards me. He used to scold me for mistakes made by others. Even the most affectionate couple do not die together. His time was up and he has gone. These people are making these comments as though they are going to provide for me. She did not seem too sad about my grandfather's passing. Despite that, she followed the local custom and tonsured her head, as was required for a Brahmin widow. She said, I have tonsured my head because of these stupid people. In those days, even young widows, among many other things they lost because of widowhood, also lost their hair and remained tonsured for the rest of their life. When I was young, I did not give it much thought. Only later in life did I realize what a terrible injustice this was towards women. I also felt extremely sad whenever I encountered these widows. So moving on, I want to go to the page where she talks about her own sister who became a widow at a very, very young age of 22. My sister became a widow eight years before my father passed away at the age of 22. I have mentioned it elsewhere. And the only custom she did not follow was shaving off her hair. Otherwise, she gave up everything normally enjoyed by married women, wearing flowers in the hair, the potu, turmeric on the face, jewelry, and good clothes. In short, widows were expected to behave like the living dead. However, even today, the state of widows has not improved sufficiently. It is still quite bad in the villages. Even now, they are not allowed to actively take part in joyous functions like weddings. They still do not wear flowers, turmeric, or the potu. A few educated women have broken this tradition and they continue to dress the way they did before their husbands died. I hope all women will ultimately do the same. That is, continue to live and dress the same way they did before they became widows. And then um, I want to now uh, switch gear and go to a sentinel event that happened in her life that made her so deeply think about the widowhood itself. Uh, to give a background, she was married when she was 13. She was still at her mom's house. She has not yet gone to her husband's place. Within a month of her wedding, the husband was diagnosed with tuberculosis. So this is the background. So she writes here, I never used to pay much attention to the plight of these widows until the time I had a certain conversation with my friend Avade. She was two years older than me. She had been married for two years when this conversation occurred. She visited me at my house in Karamane and said, I heard your husband has TB. Now, this is a terrible disease and very few people survive. My mother says that only your luck and the strength of your wedding pendant, the thali, will help him overcome this. You look gorgeous like a statue made of gold. Hope your husband can beat this. Otherwise, your life is finished. 
She continued rattling away in a blend of Malayalam and Tamil. They will ban you from wearing jewelry. They will not allow you to apply turmeric. No flowers for you. Even your thick black hair will be gone. You will most likely have to wear a white sari. And she went on and on. Mani, that is my mom's mother. Mani was taking a nap in the corridor. And when she heard this, he jumped up and came to us and yelled at Avade. What kind of nonsense are you talking to this child? How can a young girl like you talk like this? If I could, I would cut your tongue for speaking such awful things. Don't ever come to our house again. As it is, we are worried sick. I visited Avade several years later and remembered that she had caused me to become extremely anxious after the conversation that we had during the time my husband was ill. Anytime I saw a tonsured person, I would start thinking about my situation and feared I would have to have my head tonsured if my husband died. I could not bear to think of that possibility. I would be overwhelmed with fear and start crying. I began to feel empathy for all widows, old or young. However, from what I see, most people do not seem to be too bothered about this social ill. I always wondered why the issues faced by widows bothered me this much. And it is possible that my friend Avade's words deeply affected me. There's a saying that you realize or understand adversity only when you are personally affected. That is absolutely true. So then she comes to actually some years later, actually more contemporary uh, situation where she's seeing this uh, popular playback singer, Janaki in the, in the widowhood. And uh, she talks about it uh, with a lot of passion. So this is a scene where she is sitting with her son, older son, and watching TV. Um, we were talking about the famous singer Janahi. I saw her being interviewed on TV, wearing the traditional widow's white sari, and I was shocked and saddened. She had recently lost her husband. I turned to my son, who was also watching the show, and said, it's awful that she has to appear like this in a white sari and a bare forehead without a potu and not a single piece of jewelry on in this day and age. After that, I saw Janaki in several interviews on TV. Every time I saw her, I got irritated. She has not remained hidden indoors after her husband's death. She participated in all social functions, continued to be a playback singer in several languages, and generally seemed very happy. And that's the way she should be. However, I could not understand why she still appeared in this widow's garments. I feel Janaki confirmed to the old tradition because of her superstitious belief that if widows do not adhere to certain rules, their deceased husbands would meet with distress in the netherworld. Also, Janaki may have thought that since she's a well-known singer and a public figure, she would be respected only if she played the role of a widow. Since she, for some reason, believed in those superstitious Hindu customs and followed them, I will definitely place the blame for Janagi opting to appear as if she were a dead tree on the Hindu religion. Where India is concerned, I agree that other religions, especially Islam, have some draconian rules for women. But I have chosen to voice my opinion only about the terrible injustice done to Hindu widows. I'm not against the Hindu religion, but I want to purge blind beliefs from the religion and retain only the good and noble parts. However people take it, I have just vented my concerns. I feel that the topic of Hindu widows is an important one that needed to be a part of my autobiography. And then I want to now uh, again switch to a different uh, part of her uh, memoirs, uh, where she shows um, that uh, how stifling it was to live in the house where she lived, that is her joint family, but she tried to break some rules. And so the, I think that uh, is an interesting uh, part of her um, thing. So I would like to share that here. One of the acts of defiance, which may seem trivial, but it was a big deal for her. Uh, was switching from the nine yard sari to the six yard sari. So uh, here she says, I wore the traditional nine yard saris for about nine years. So because you know she was in that, she came into the house when she was 14. So she wore the sari till she was about um, 23. I switched to wearing the much more comfortable and easy to wrap six yard sari at the age of 23. 
Two houses down the street lived Muthumami. I used to visit her place often. She would say, women of your age are switching to the Telugu style of six-yard sari. Why don't you also wear the six-yard saris? It will make you look younger, unlike the nine-yard sari, which makes even the young girls look old, like old women. So when I bought my new royal sari, mommy and her daughter said I looked very beautiful. I looked at myself in the mirror and felt I looked younger and more beautiful. But at our house, everyone except my husband treated me like I had done something very wrong. As usual, I managed not to respond to their comments and ignore them. I used to be so afraid of them and really don't know how I got the courage to defy them in this particular matter. Then she talks about this bittersweet moment, again, in the context of the sari thing. I bought myself a simple sari without brocade in light orange color of Kanakamparam, the firecracker flower with a black border, and another sari in gold and yellow, the color of a gold colored beetle with light gold brocade border. One day in the night, after everyone had gone to sleep, I wore the orange colored sari, went upstairs and stood in front of my husband, who was deep into his books. He normally was up late till midnight, every day, reading. He did not even look up. Since the electricity would go off often and the bulbs were also not bright, usually he would be lying on his stomach while reading and would have a bright oil lamp next to him. I waited for some time and then said, look up. He said, why do you want me to look at you? Oh, I see. You have a new sari. Looks really good. Having said that, he went back to his reading. I was quite disappointed. And I decided then and there, I wouldn't bother to impress him anymore. And then uh, I want to also read a small portion from a different part of the uh, book, where again, she talks about how she found the house uh, situation very stifling. I'm absolutely certain that Shobha's interest, Shobha is her oldest daughter, Shobha's interest and aptitude for music came from me. I used to memorize the lyrics and music of all the movie songs, but I did not dare sing them in our house. Even humming a tune was not tolerated by my father-in-law. I remember that once I was humming my favorite tune from, I think the movie Shakuntala, when Sidae came up to me and curtly said, Anna is not well. You are singing without consideration for his health. He doesn't like it. Here, here Anna is actually the um, father-in-law. From the time I arrived at my in-law's place, all I can remember about my father-in-law was his constant obsession with his bodily functions and his health. He would keep complaining about minor ailments like constipation and insomnia. And at times, make them seem like some major disease. He used to get angry at the slightest noise and would throw a tantrum if someone, especially me, so much as breathed heavily. If he was unwell and I went out with my friends to watch a movie, he would be very bitter and resentful when I returned and make it up obvious by grumbling, a person in this house is dying and nobody cares. So, um, I would also like to share uh, one more thing. This is about a friend she had. She only, probably she didn't have too many friends. And this was a particular uh, girl pro who she really became friendly with, who was somewhat younger than her, but um, was a free spirit. So her name was Padmavadi. My mother refers to her as Pavu in most, uh, most of the book. So she has a special, there is a special chapter called My Friend Padmavadi. So I'm reading from that. Pavu was a very nice person. There was a 25 year difference in age between her and Raman Mama. So the, to give a background, Pavu at age 16 had to take care of her mother and her sister. Uh, financially, they were insecure. And so Pavu got to know this older gentleman who took her under his wings and taught her music. And with that, she made some money. So this is the person we are talking about. So Pau was a very nice person. There was a 25 year difference in age between her and Raman Mama. He looked very thin, but Pau liked him a lot. And they had an intimate relationship. Pau had mentioned that in her conversations with me. There was so much age difference and he was not at all that good looking either. I know why Pau still liked Raman. Pau knew him from a very young age. 
He wrote songs and scripts for plays. He taught her music and took her to many Kadakala Shevam performances. Raman also drew pictures and did beautiful paintings. During Navaratri festival, he would have a beautiful Golu arrangement of dolls at his house, and his artistry was showcased in that exhibit. As a matter of fact, he was popularly known as Artist Raman. Pavu was young, attractive, and was working and making good money. She later married this person. She was married to this elderly man in many ways was under his control. She gave all her income to him and would spend for herself only with his permission. Society allows a man to be intimate, to have a second woman in his life and blatantly set up a second household with her. That in no way seemed to affect his standing in society. On the other hand, if a woman had an extramarital affair, the neighboring women, both young and old, would call her a prostitute. They also had disparaging names for widows and infertile women, labeling them barren and wasted, even though more than half the case of infertility were due to issues with the man. Such language is not just used by women in villages. Even the so-called sophisticated women in the city speak this way. I think I have written about this elsewhere in the journal. Most married women, be it the first wife or the second wife, did not exactly overflow with love for their husbands. Fear of society, blind beliefs, and having nowhere to go made many women conform and suppress their own needs and go on with their lives in a servile manner. As far as Pau was concerned, she respected her husband a lot. She loved him. She would never do anything without his approval. She was proud of him and spoke highly of him. So um, I think I would like to share one more passage and come to an end. So I want to go back before I end again to her um, um, opinions about, uh, uh, about widows. So she herself knows that she's repeating it again, but it has affected her a whole lot. And so she goes back to the, so she wanted to also make sure that this was not just a Brahmin thing. So she here, she talks about it. The non-Brahmins did not tonsure the widow, but they too followed all other customs of degrading the widows in terms of appearance and functioning in the society. They had many other rituals too. Even if a woman is a young widow, all these rituals were observed. All the relatives would come and cover her with a white sari. I saw this ritual detailed in a recent TV serial. Most of the serials have stories revolving around non-Brahmin families. Despite caste differences, the customs would be similar. In the TV drama I mentioned, there was this middle-aged widow dressed in a beautiful sari, wearing jewelry, glass bangles, and traditional kungum potu on her forehead, and her hair decked with flowers. Then some other widows surrounded her and ceremoniously took away her jewelry, broke the bangles, took off the flowers, rubbed off the potu from the forehead and had her wear a white sari. So ended that day's episode, which deeply saddened me. I'm not sure if other women feel as distressed as I do on seeing such practices. Women have progressed a lot, but it has happened only in the urban areas. But even modern households observe the practice of excluding widows and preventing them fully participating in auspicious occasions and ceremonies. At least nowadays, the widows are seated with everyone else, unlike in those days where they had to remain out of sight. However, at many weddings today even, where widows are sitting with other married women, when it comes to offering flowers and kumkumam to greet the women guests, they are bypassed and ignored. So I want to end here actually with the email I got from my cousin, I think just recently, this is dated February 11th, 2022. This is my cousin who lives in Canada, who was attending her sister's son's wedding. So I had sent her a link to my book in Amazon. So she had seen that and she had read the blurb and then she has written this to me. Hi, Kanchana, what a labor of love. How exciting that you have come out with this. I look forward to purchasing and reading it. I'm here in India for Suja's son's wedding. It was a beautiful affair. They were all very polished and sensitive. However, I did experience very subtly the indignities that women who have lost their spouses face. So this book is timely for me. Take care and best. She had just lost her husband a few months ago, unexpectedly, to COVID. So this is the state of affair 
in February 2022. So I'm somewhat glad that I have a book which talks about the ills of the society when it comes to treatment of widows. And I'm also sad that it is not done yet. Thank you for listening to me. Chalamar's journal is available to purchase worldwide. To get your copy, please visit www.yodapress.co.in. The Yodakin podcast is produced by Tanya Singh and assisted and edited by Chitraj Ashley. It is available wherever you find and listen to your podcasts.